about to leave already packing come with me i'm not really asking we'll get away to a place where we don't know about to see the world in action what we can be life with no distractions we'll get away this is what we waited for everybody it's John here from Tutor to you welcoming you along to another one of our study live stream sessions for a level geography tonight we're going to spend 30 minutes or so considering uh, meaning and representation of place uh, I'm informed this is a particularly tricky topic for a level geographer so hopefully you're going to get an awful lot out of it a uh, big welcome to anybody who's watching this live let me just have a look on the clock we've got a few people here uh, welcome to you it would be lovely to see your responses and answers in the chat window on YouTube if you can please that was always useful and valuable to us to know how you're getting along if you're watching this on replay on catch up welcome to you as well of course you can take a little bit more time uh, and pause the video where you think it's necessary when having a go at some of the questions um, I'm here tonight with two very uh, able and popular presenters for us we've got Suzanne in the middle of the screen and Alice Hi. on the right hand side <laughs> good evening both are we okay Hi. Really yeah. good tonight, yeah. Looking forward to the session. Good stuff. Well, let's get started then, shall we? Fab. Okay, thank you. Right, okay, welcome everybody. So, meaning and representation. What are we going to be covering tonight and what do you need to know? So, first of all, you can see there that it is the importance of meanings which we attach to places, how they are formed either through lived experience or influenced and shaped by different representations. And it's those different representations that we're really going to be looking um, at in more depth tonight. We're going to be covering how we perceive and form attachment to places. We're going to be looking at the ways in meanings are linked to different experiences and to identities, how place is represented in different forms and that give contrasting images. So we'll have a little look at some pictures which actually contrast an area. Uh, we'll be looking at how groups can create 
or influence meaning of place and past and present processes of development, which can also influence place meaning. So I think Alice is going to kick us off with some of our theory. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, so we've got quite a lot to have a look at today. So if we go back to the basics as to how we define place, what is this concept place? So it's a space infused with human meaning was what Tuan suggested. It's a, it's a place infused with human meaning. So it's something that somewhere that has meaning for someone. That's our starting point. Beyond this, the term place meaning can be approached by in two different ways. So here we've got the phenomenological approach of Ifu Tuan and Edward Relf. And we also have the social constructionist approach uh, taken by the likes of Doreen Massey and John Anderson. So just to tell you a little bit about those approaches, the phenomenological uh, geographers really were interested in it, the subjective and very personal experience that a person might have in a place, which leads to an individual's attachment to it, or conversely, perhaps fear of it. So we're thinking about topophilia, love of place, or conversely, topophobia. On the other hand, we've got social constructionists. So these are geographers that were influenced by, for example, Marxist geography, geographies. So these are people who are interested in social structures which shape our everyday lives to benefit what they would say are the powerful groups in society. These geographers weren't so much interested in the personal and the individual, but they were interested in the shared or social experience and, and meaning of places and, and looked at them from two different aspects. So they were interested in the fact that places are dynamic, not static. So they look at them as ever changing and shaped by key human processes, such as, as Massey wrote about globalization, but also things like industrialization, uh, land reform, the patriarchy, colonialism. So they were looking at these social, these key social processes and showing that, that the meaning of places changes over time and the historical context is really important. The other side of things was that they were saying that not only were they changing, but they're created by people. So they weren't interested in places having intrinsic characteristics that perhaps the phenomenological geographers might have looked at. They were thinking about um, the fact that these places are shaped by people at particular times. So two different approaches that I want you to be aware of when we're thinking about place meaning and sense of place. Can we have the next slide, please? OK, so this term sense of place, here's a, uh, a quote from Ifu Tuan. Place comes into existence when humans give meaning to a part of the large undifferentiated space. And if you've looked at the way uh, also Agnew uh, defines the concept of place, he's, he splits it up into to three aspects, location, locale and sense of place. So it's about this subjective experience of, of, of being there, emotional attachment. But also I'd, I'd like to add that this sense of place is a phrase used by other agencies, perhaps tourist agencies and uh, the likes of architects and landscape architects who are considering um, something we might term the genius loci, the, the essential unique character of a place that perhaps new developments needs to need to respect or uh, tourist materials need to convey to visitors. So just to just to give you a bit of uh, light and shade there that this sense of this phrase sense of place is perhaps used in, in two different ways and I guess the social constructionists would say that um, places that are culturally significant to powerful groups are perhaps those ones that are more actively conserved or protected. OK, so this is your first opportunity to interact with the session. Um, you're going to have 60 seconds to match up some key definitions um, or definitions rather of key terms. So if we can have a look at the slide. John, so we can see what we're doing here. Yeah, so on the left-hand side, we've got five key terms links, linked to our, our attempt to, to define the concept of place. And along the right-hand side, we have some definitions. So we're going to need you to write uh, letters matched to numbers 
into the chat window and we'd love to see you interacting, but you've got 60 seconds. Okay then, great. Thank you to Sam for having a go there and well done. Let's have a look at some of the correct answers. Obviously, if you were watching on Catch Up, you had the chance to pause this and have a bit of a think. Okay, so key terms we need to define. So A2 was the correct answer. A representation is the depiction of a place in a particular way. B3, non-material traces are events or emotions experienced in a place that can give meaning to it. And it was the likes of John Anderson that was talking about these traces that may be material or non-material, linked to thinking about the heritage of a place. Sense of place, C4, is the feelings and emotions of place evokes which are personal and exper experiential. D5 was exactly a specific point in space. Its coordinates, i.e. latitude and longitude, are the location of a place. And the phenomenological approach is the study of how individuals experience place and create place, place meaning. And well done to other people who have had a go. Lots of correct answers there. OK, let's have the next slide, please. OK, so. Yeah, just to finish off what I was saying about representation. So we're going to be looking today at some different rep representations of places to get you thinking about what some of the sources are when it comes to your own place studies, or you could call them case studies, but, but within the AQA specification, you're required to do two place studies. And it's not just what you find out about these place studies. Um, the examiner will also be interested in what you found most interesting, perhaps what gave you the most insight into the place. OK, so we've got examples here of qualitative data sources. These we might see as subjective representations. They're be being created by individuals or perhaps in the example of a, a film or a TV programme, a group of individuals who are giving a partial view or a representation of a place according according to them. So those are subjective. What about quantitative data sources we might use? So places can also be represented using numbers and statistics um, and scaled maps and indices of deprivation. And these are all valid um, data sources for us to investigate case studies or place studies as geographers often seen as more objective data. I've just popped that question mark in there because I'd like you to have a think about, are they true facts? OK, we maybe want to problematize that a little bit at A level. OK, Suzanne, I believe. Right, yes, thank you. OK, so I'm going to be having a little look at perception and attachment. So you can see there it says the emotional connection between a person and a place is referred to as place attachment. So this is about the person to place bonds that can evolve through that emotional connection that you might have with a place. Similarly, as um, Alice has been talking about, this is a very subjective so that's based on someone's own experience and very individual and very often is most strongly developed through personal lived experience. It's not to say that you can't develop an attachment with somewhere that you haven't visited because you might have experienced it through social media, through the TV, um, through you know other media channels. But it's most likely that your your strong attachment is going to be through that personal lived experience. Also, the stronger the emotional experience that you have in a place, 
um, the theory suggests or studies suggest that actually the stronger the attachment. So you're more likely to feel something called topophilia, which is the love of a place, the bond between the person and that place, which often ends up being expressed as saying that someone has a strong sense of place. And it can also become mixed up with a strong sense of cultural identity. Um, but it can also simply just be a person's love of a particular place. And it could be that actually, as you're sitting here listening, you can think of a few places that you have a really strong attachment to. We often start with home. That's often the place that we feel the most comfortable in, the where we feel the most ourselves. So we often have a strong sense of place of where we live, of our bedrooms. Um, and obviously, as we explore the world, we might get attached to more places with the more experience we have of them. Now, the opposite of topophilia, you can see there is topophobia. So it's the intense dislike of a place. So something where you potentially have had a very negative personal lived experience there. Um, I know for me, I'm not very keen on going near the local hospital. I don't I don't like that place. It makes me feel quite uncomfortable. Um, so there are places that we have an attraction to and a real love and others that we don't like. Right, if we can go to the next slide, please. Right, so I think Ed Sheeran did us geographers a real favor because he created quite a good song for us to study at A-level um, because a really good example of this concept of attachment is articulated in the lyrics that he wrote to Castle on the Hill. And this has been described um, by many as his love letter to Suffolk as it really evokes the memories of his childhood growing up in Framlingham in Suffolk, um, where there is indeed a castle on the hill. And as you can see, I found the castle on the hill and that's what it looks like. Um, but the lyrics actually is to, to geographers give this real insight into that idea of that strong personal experience and then the, the um, attachment to place. So luckily for you guys, I'm not going to be singing to you. Um, but I'm just going to read some of the lyrics. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with his song, but it was a couple of years ago now. So I'm just going to read out and you just listen to where you can think these strong um, experiences that he had that are very vivid in the song that really create that um, bond that he, an emotional attachment that he has with the place. So it's when I was six years old, I broke my leg. I was running for my brothers and his friends and I tasted the sweet perfume of the mountain grass I rolled down. I was younger then, take me back to when I found my heart and broke it there, made friends and lost them through the years. And I've not seen the roaring fields in so long. I know I've grown, but I can't wait to go home. So in his lyrics there, you can see some, you know, significant events that are happening obviously running away from his brother and his friends he's broken his leg but also that idea of him engaging with all the senses of actually what he can smell of what he can see um of what he can feel and it's those kind of ideas that he conveys in that song which really show us a really strong um sense of topophobia uh, topophilia not topophobia topophilia and actually research has suggested that most people do actually feel at ease in the type of landscape that they grew up in and that many people when they actually go back to a place that they're really familiar with from childhood feel a lot less stressed and anyone who does move often over abroad often tries to recreate some of the surroundings that they were used to from their childhood if they move away. So something to remember there, topophilia, but also this can be really mixed up with creating a strong sense of identity. And John, if we can move on to that. <laughs> I'm not going to be doing m, &M no. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Right. So place, meaning and identity. So this brings us on to identity. And it says there, we, where we live shapes us. Our emotional connection to a place, our personal sense of place, or our understanding of the features and characteristics of the place can shape our identity. And I actually found a quite an interesting quote from Winston Churchill, which was, we shape buildings, thereafter they shape us. And although that quote it refers to obviously the built environment and as geographers, we would want to add into that something about the natural landscape. It's actually about how place can become mixed up with engendering a sense of our cultural or place identity. Are you a Brummie? Are you a Liverpudlian, a Mancunian or maybe a Londoner? 
And actually, the National Trust conducted a survey of young people and 67% of them actually said that the place that they grew up with was really meaningful in shaping who they are. On top of that, you can see that identity can actually be multi-layered and we can identify at, a mul at multiple different scales. So we might identify with the village or the town or the city we live in. We might uh, identify ourselves as the region of the UK. Are you a northerner? Are you a southerner? Do you live in Wales? Are you Welsh? Are you Scottish? Or it could even be at a larger scale where we actually start to think, well, are we Europeans? Um, so it can we can be multiple identities at the same time. And this concept of identity actually can lead to, as you can see there on the right hand side, um, localism, regionalism and nationalism. So localism is an affection for your locality where you live. Um, it's often kind of demonstrated as um, nimbyism. So whenever there's change, often people who feel very strongly attached to where they live, their local area will often try to resist those um, changes. And nimbyism is not in my backyard. So not wanting any developments to change um, an, an area that they may cherish and they really love. Regionalism is obviously loyalty to a distinct region. So again, that could be a certain part of the UK. Um, and nationalism is this devotion to nation and building a sense of a national consciousness. Right, okay, John, thank you. So we're gonna do some true and false. So I'd love to see some um, uh, answers in the chat box. Um, and obviously, if you're playing along on catch up, you can just jot them down on a piece of paper. Right. So true or false attachment lessons with age. Do you think this is true or do you think this is false? Just pop your answer in the chat box. Who's going to be the first to get it right? Let's see. Got a 50 50 chance of getting it right, as always. Yeah, T or F. That's great. Brilliant. OK, oh, I'm getting some good answers. Well done, Josh, Sam and Mariha. Well done. Right. OK, let's do the reveal, John. OK, so this is false. Of course, attachment increases. The more we experience a place, the more likely we are for our attachment to deepen. Uh, question number two. An intense experience in a place can lead to greater emotional attachment. What do you reckon to this one? Is this one true or is this one false? Oh, well done, Sam. Quick off the mark there. And Josh, Jack, well done. Right, let's see the answer, please, John. Wonderful. Yes, this is, of course, true. So if we have an intense experience in a place, we often have a much, much deeper and greater emotional attachment to it. And again, you might be able to think of places that you really, <laughs> that's all right, John, uh, you, you really uh, have had an amazing experience in and you feel like a real sense of attachment to it when you, you know, think fondly of, of what happened there. Right, on to the next one. Thank you. Question number three, our identities can be multi-layered and we can identify places at a variety of scales. Oh, I've got some good good um, answers tonight. Lots of people joining in. That's lovely to see. So what, we, what do we reckon for this one? Are we true or false on this one? Yeah, I've got some coming in. Brilliant. Well done. Right, John, can you do the reveal? It is, in, uh, of course, true. So you might feel that you identify as someone um, I don't know, you could be a, a Londoner, but a Southerner. So you can have multi layers. Right. And I think, oh, we've got two more. So photos, fiction and art are all unreliable sources for studying a sense of place. What do you reckon to this one? They're unreliable sources for studying a sense of place. But Alice talked a little bit about this. So have we got some answers coming in? I think people are a little bit more hesitant on this one. Oh, yeah. First one. Well done, Mariha. Jack. Good. Right. Can we have the reveal, please, John? This, is, of course, is false. So although they might be subjective, it doesn't mean to say they're unreliable because when we're looking at place, we want to know about people's individual um, kind of experiences and, and the meaning to them. So we're looking at those kind of multiple individual meanings. So although, you know, you, you they're not 
factual in the same way that census data might be, they're not unreliable, they're still important for us to use. Right, and I think we've got the final question. Thank you. So qualitative data is subjective. Do you think that is true or do you think that is false? I think, Sam, you might have got that in quickly, didn't you? Yeah. Well done. OK. Fab stuff. Right. And can I have the reveal, please, John? Is it course true? OK, so we're talking qualitative data, things like the photos, social media, fiction, um, painting, sculpture, all of those things that were on that previous slide um, that Alice was chatting about. Right, so we've got our next game. We've got a big reveal now. So I'm going to reveal a number of clues. What I want you to do is when you think you know what the answer is, type it in the chat box. Obviously, if you're playing on catch up, then just, um, well, <laughs> you can find out whether you've got it right at the end. Um, so if we can have the first um, clue, please, John. So this may be a layer of our identity. So it's going to be hard to guess it from that. But if you want to have a go, please do and pop it in the chat box. Right, John, I think, should we reveal the next one? Can make people resistant to change. Oh, definitely more points for the, the, the earlier you get it, I think. So maybe a layer of our identity can make people resistant to change. Let's go for three, please, John. May prompt support for local businesses. So stuff like buy local. You might have heard that before, buy local. We heard it lot in lockdown, actually. Um, people saying support local businesses so that they didn't go out of business. Oh, I've got no one guessing yet. So let's let's go with four. It can increase over time. So this can get stronger. Anyone going to? It's harder than saying true or false, isn't it? You had a 50-50 chance there. This one's a bit trickier. Right, let's go with the last one, John. Linked to nimbyism. See if you can work out what you think that might be. So you've got five clues there now. Okay, I think, John, let's have a reveal. So this is, oh, not quite. Well done, Maria. Um, localism. Okay, remember that's the um, affection that we can have for our localities. It's a strong attachment. Um, so, yeah, there we go. Right, okay. And I think I'm now passing over to Alice for a short while. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, okay, so how external agencies influence or create place meaning. So this is something that we are interested in, thinking about contrasting representations, who's creating those contrasting uh, representations and perhaps for what, what purpose. So we know that external agencies can manipulate representations and influence people and try to create meaning through place marketing, re-imaging, rebranding, all part of what we might call the sort of placemaking process. Um, and community groups or local groups can actively support or, or try to counteract that, perhaps with their own representations. This slide just summarizes what we mean by external agencies. So we've got things like perhaps national, regional tourist organizations. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about, for example, Visit Cornwall. We might also have decisions that are taken at a national level, perhaps about the number of houses that should be built in different areas. We might have decisions taken by regional government, but also by corporate bodies. So we're talking about companies that might be a house builder, for example. So all of those external agencies may try to make decisions about perhaps your local area and perhaps in terms of what they say in the media about those decisions, create particular uh, representations which may not chime with how local people see their area. Uh, where I live, um, we're uh, in the firing line for HS2. And when it was being drawn up, uh, a government minister visited uh, the Chilterns and, and, and suggested, uh, so his words were, it's no constable country. 
uh, making a reference to uh, a famous artist who painted landscapes, suggesting that it wasn't an area that Constable would have chosen to paint. It wasn't aesthetically uh, natural, pretty enough, wh whatever. Whereas local groups responded and, and perhaps campaigned against this representation, trying to perhaps reassert the value of the landscape, which was already an, an area of outstanding uh, natural beauty and perhaps celebrate its, its ancient woodlands. So we have these different representations going on constantly in the media around big development projects. So HS2, one, one example for you. How do external agencies influence or create place meaning? If we step away from the controversy and look at tourism, so the tourist gaze is not necessarily the, the same view of a place that local people have that live there. Um, and the tourist gaze is the direction and manipulation of images um, and organization, often by tourist agencies, of our perceptions of tourist destinations, which can create certain expectations. Uh, I think Paris famously is one of the sort of places where some people get there and don't get exactly what they were expecting. Now, in the photograph here, we have um, Giza, um, uh, part of the metropolitan area of Cairo. But that's a particular view of the pyramids that we might argue is a tiny bit photoshopped. Let's have a look at the next slide, please, John. So here are some other photographs of um, the same uh, tourist destination. So we've got the, the, the pyramids of Giza. And here we can see just how close uh, this destination is to the noise and the pollution and the hustle and the bustle of daily life in Giza, which, as I say, is part of the metropolitan area of Cairo, which you'll remember is the largest urban area in Africa. So here we can see that perhaps tourist agencies are taking photographs from particular angles to give a particular view and build a particular expectation about what visitors will get when they arrive. OK, if we could have the next slide, please. So just closer to home, let's think about an example in the UK and the rebranding of a place called Padstow. Now, Padstow in North Cornwall was a traditional fishing village and port and a holiday destination. But in the 1980s, Cornwall and Padstow suffered from a decline in tourists as uh, flights were cheaper and increasingly uh, Brits certainly tended to look at, uh, to go abroad on holiday. So there was a need to attract more visitors and particularly visitors year round to kind of boost employment opportunities and, and, and support this place. So what happened next? Well, in fact, Padstow has become an incredibly successful um, place uh, in terms of the tourism within Cornwall. So, and it's actually dubbed, Pad, is it Padstow or Padstein? Those of you that have been there may know that Rick Stein, uh, a celebrity chef, opened the seafood restaurant in Padstow. And his, his celebrity, uh, his work on the BBC producing cooking programmes and a whole range of programmes uh, was, was perhaps jumped on by Visit Cornwall, who uh, then uh, marketed this place as a destination for foodies. Rick Stein went on to have great success with his restaurant and went on to acquire many more restaurants, cafes and shops. And now that two, I believe two thirds of Padstow's, um, uh, the, the settlement of Padstow are, are employed by Stein Enterprises, hence this uh, dubbing of the place Pad Stein. Um, if we could look at the next slide, please. So who was involved in this place marketing? As I say, mainstream media, clearly the BBC was involved in influencing uh, visitors' behaviour, choices to visit Padstow, but tourist agencies were also in there and, and, and dubbed the place the heart of gourmet Cornwall, Cornwall's food capital and the jewel in the crown of Cornwall. Uh, the place has featured in many uh, different television programmes and of course people who visited it felt it was special and shared their own experiences 
on social media. So both the visitors and organised agencies were boosting the reputation of this place. So multiple representations created by external agents have shaped the behaviour of tourists and individuals and, and led it to become a very successful um, tourist destination. Although clearly there's a little bit of an edge to this uh, nickname Pad Stein. And when I had a little look on TripAdvisor today, there were certainly some um, concerns that it was, um, well, the phrase was used inauthentic and a bit expensive. I don't know. What do you think about that, Suzanne? Well, sorry. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very pricey down there, um, certainly. Um, but I think at the same time, it has um, it's, it's boosted the economy hugely. So and it is. I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs, particularly in the Cornish community, that have set up um, sort of small shops there and, and restaurants and cafes. But um, yeah, it's difficult to know what's authentic anymore, isn't it? Yeah, it's a double edged sword, isn't it? Success yeah. in, the, in the tourist industry. Yeah. OK, over mm. to you. Right. OK, so I'm going to have a look at these uh, two different types of representations, really, um, and moving towards looking at an exam question. So I'm going to be looking at census data, which, of course, is quantitative data. And then we're going to be contrasting that against diverse media, which is the qualitative. So here we can see I just picked out this is for a place. I'm not going to tell you where it is at the moment, because it could be that as soon as I say the name, you may have been there. So all of a sudden place meaning will become, you know, flooding in and, and actually will change your perception. So this is um, some just some data that I picked up from census. Um, obviously, it's numerical. Um, they've classified this place as a multicultural metropolitan inner city. And we can begin to infer certain things from this census data. So we, we know that there's a wide variety of nationalities present. The population graph you can see there shows that over time, there's been different periods of growth. There's been a period of decline and another period of growth. So potentially knowing it's the inner city, we could be, begin to infer that maybe there's been periods of industrialization and then deindustrialization and then probably regeneration or reurbanization. Um, we can see that there's potentially higher levels of poverty because there's more local authority housing um, in the area, that, that first pie chart there, um, and rental accommodation than, than in other areas of the UK. And also there's a relatively high proportion of economically inactive from the second pie chart there. So census data can begin to give us a kind of a bit of a place meaning we can begin to infer different ideas about some of the processes that might be happening there maybe some things that might have been experienced from our understanding of you know how these geographical processes have affected the inner city over time and some of that we can see evidenced in the census data However, I would argue that we can't really get a really informed sense of place from census data alone. So, John, if we can move on to our second um, uh, slide, thank you. Right, so this is the contrast with diverse media, and I'm gonna be fo focusing on photographs, um, but obviously there's other diverse media like paintings, sculpture, fiction, um, non-fiction, all of the, again, the, the earlier slide that you saw um, on representations and qualitative representations. But here, what these photos do is they actually give us um, a much sort of more developed sense of place they are beginning to reveal other layers of meaning which aren't necessarily evident in the census data. That census data showed us about population growth more recently, but this very first image you can see actually shows us how this translates into this place. You can see the huge amount of building, those construction cranes um, towering along the, uh, the skyline, high rise landscape, we're beginning to see, you know, it doesn't necessarily look like a, uh, many sort of towns um, or smaller cities. This is this is a real kind of city landscape. It's very modern and it looks like it's ever evolving. And the census data just couldn't convey that to us. It couldn't portray or represent that to us in the same way. Again, that second picture there, you can see the multicultural element of the city can be better understood by by this representation. It gives us 
a greater sense of place. The shop fronts, the bright colours, the range and the variety of food and clothing. And we can infer from this image that the, the place is likely to be filled with, filled with kind of different smells of the different foods that are being cooked in the restaurants. Um, the music that might be playing, you might have Bangra music to Afrobeats. It's a very, very multicultural and diverse area. And again, perhaps some images that we can look at, like photos, or give us a, a better sense of place than that census data that just gave us a category. Right, John, if you can move on to the next photo. Thank you. Again, a few more images. Now I'm gonna to reveal to you, this is actually Scratford um, in East London. So this is all around near the um, Olympic Park. So what the images, or sorry, what that census data definitely couldn't tell us was about these contrasts because actually the first two photos you see there aren't included in the census data that we currently have so our most current census data that has been published so far is from 2011 and actually in 2011 these flats were not lived in okay they were being built or, or, or finished off so we can't see any information from census data about this because it's too old um hopefully next you know when they release it probably early next year we'll begin to actually um be able to see the impact that this has had on the census data of the area um and yeah so and um, what we don't see in the census data is just like that dynamic change and how um how quickly it's altered and how how fast um the landscape has altered and the contrast between the different parts of stratford census data doesn't give us that whereas perhaps other photos and other types of representation can give us more of an idea sense of sense of that inequality and and, and difference between those two areas so that um third photo there is um taken in something called ironically newtown which is now the older part of stratford whereas the um uh, first two photos is from um, East Village. Right, John, if you can move on to the next one. Okay, so the area uh, we're focused on has a real significant place meaning. And actually this can be presented in images that were taken at the events. So remember that idea of non-material traces. So in the past, the 2012 Olympic Games took place in Stratford in East London. We can see there the iconic Olympic rings, which can be seen all around the Queen Elizabeth Park, and they have got a real personal meaning to many. They may to you, you may remember from the time, the excitement around the Olympics coming to the UK. This place has become nationally important Again, I don't think you can see that through the census data. It was the centre of international media attention for several weeks during 2020, uh, 2012 and the hopes and dreams for athletes and also for many supporters. And the photographic representations, I think, in this case, add layers of meaning that de census data on its own just cannot convey. So it's, it's a different kind of sense of place. It's a different place meaning. John, could you just pass on to the next one? Right, so <laughs> here we've got some pictures of me and actually my emotional um, kind of uh, feeling for this place. So as soon as you say Stratford, there's sort of those, those attachments in my brain sort of go and I start thinking of this very, very fondly because all sorts of other media can convey the genius loci of place. We can see there that we can create iconic images so if we see anything with the 2012 logo on it, it kind of brings to mind this. We celebrate the architecture, the built or the natural landscape. In this case, very a lot of the Olympic buildings are quite iconic. And as soon as you see them, you know exactly where it's coming from. And they play a role in informing local, regional and national identities. The Olympic Stadium and photos of that architecture is really unique, it's eye-catching, it's instantly recognisable and that can be portrayed through photos and even though photos can't necessarily represent feelings and emotions, they can to some extent um, really show that excitement, the pride in that national sporting event, the idea of kind of I think the, the coming together of people in the UK, the sense of national pride, um, again, really helping um, sort of develop a stronger attachment to that sense of um, belonging. 
And through these photos, hopefully you can get a sense of that genius loci, the spirit of the place. And definitely during those moments, during 2012, it was definitely for me just such an exciting time. And arguably the place transcends the built environment. It conveys lots of hopes and dreams and the long lasting legacy to the people of East London. It's a source of national pride now, something we go to and we and we kind of feel really proud that we managed to pull it off. <laughs> so many people thought that it wouldn't get built in time, but they managed to pull it off and it was an amazing game. And census data just can't show us those personal emotional attachments and relationships that people have to place how the built environment or place can take on new and changing meaning, meanings. And obviously, as you can see here, for me, this place is highly personal. It has real subjective meaning, which can be conveyed when I look at photos of the venue. The excitement and wonder of walking in every time I see photos of the Olympic Park. I remember, you know, seeing thousands of people, the tension, the noise in the stadium, collective cheering and the Mexican waves that just rippled across the stadium again and again. And in this is in part, I say, you know, you just you, you get that from media, that that diverse media. But census data alone doesn't give it. Um, diverse media can elicit that emotional response and even though I'm a very very passionate geographer and I do love my geography I'll be absolutely honest and I'll say when I look at census data I don't have that same emotional response not sure whether Alice does either <laughs> we'll ask her in a minute right if you can move on to the uh, next slide right so also we can see here photos um, can show contrasting viewpoints. As we said, they're subjective. They're the viewpoint of the photographer. They have chosen what the viewer is going to see. And these images I've chosen are to represent that kind of subjectivity and the bias. Um, because you can see here the glossy brochure images of the unique architecture of the Olympic Park are actually in contrast to those rundown images of Fish Island, which is just on the edges of the park. Um, and a photo there showing the tensions of gentrification. So you've got an area certified as economic, economically cleansed um, on, the, on the poster. Then a graffiti on the side of the house next to that derelict site, which says broken homes. That derelict site is about to be redeveloped. And again, these photos of um, Fish Island, you look at it and you think, oh, mm, it's a bit run down. But actually, they've also been carefully curated. They've been chosen because if you swing the camera around, you're actually standing outside a smart, a very uh, gated block of a refurbished warehouse apartments, which happen to be overlooking these views. Right. I think we're now going to have a look at an exam practice. So question could be for a 20 marker. Remember, these are the longest um, questions you will write on this um, on your paper. To what extent is census data more useful than diverse media such as poetry, photographs and paintings in representing place? So first thing we're going to do is think about what some of those keywords are. So, John, can you? Yep. Yeah. So there we go. As our census data on our media like poetry, photographies and paintings and of course our command word is to what extent so we need to weigh up so if we have a look at a kind of overview of some of the things that we might be thinking of saying so there you can see our census data the sort of the, the ways in which census data is useful is that it's quantifiable it's numerical and it's considered more objective we also consider it to represent place more factually and we can make inferences about the possible processes affecting the place. If you remember on that first slide showing you the census data, we could kind of look at population and think about industrialization, you know, deindustrialization, and then reurbanization. Um, it can also contrast with views of the media. So the media might be curating certain images, and actually census data might be able to either corroborate or alternatively show that actually the media have been distorting a view of the place the sort of the the ways in which census data perhaps isn't as um useful is that our current data is out of date 2011 we're looking at data a decade old and somewhere like stratford that's changed so dramatically um over the last 10 years it's you know it didn't even include his village um it can be very difficult to visualize the area before i showed you the photos really from that census data you couldn't kind of form an opinion of what it might look like. Um, it 
only looks at area at the lowest level output area and that's around um was it 310 residents so that's the smallest layer we can get to um and also the parameters of the census data are restricted so they're only asking a certain um, number of questions so you can't necessarily see the bigger picture when we look at diverse media, so that's poetry, photographs and painting, and obviously I focused on the photos in this presentation, we get a better, better sense of place potentially. It's, it gives us a far greater ability to interpret the landscapes, any interactions, relationships and connections people might have with place. It's much more personal, so it can be used to create really emotional responses. However, what we must also remember is that it does have potentially some downsides um, and it's subjective. It's curated by the author. So whoever is creating or representing that place has got a certain viewpoint. They may choose to misrepresent, misrepresent it. So like the tourist agencies who create tourist gaze, but it can also be much more authentic. So it could be showing, you know, lived experience. So it's, it's not necessarily a misrepresentation. It just is one person's view. It's often very small scale. So as you saw my photos kind of focusing on and small parts of the area, so it can't represent the whole place. You know, Stratford's, you know, extremely diverse. Um, and I can't show that in one picture. And also it can be Photoshop to fake the place. You know, you can take photos now and you can alter them to show what you want. Right, if we can move on to just the exam gold. Brilliant. Okay, so this question, of course, requires you to make a judgment. It's a weighing up. It's an evaluative question. So you should be looking at both sides of the argument. So you would need to give examples and evidence of where census data represents place. Well, so what, you know, what, what does it do? And that's good but also aspects where it falls short of representing place. So again, that previous slide, I just talked about some of those negative things. But very often I would, well, not say very often, I would pretty much always say, focus on your local or your contrasting place. You need to know your places really, really well. You need to know the census data, you need to be able to quote things. You need to have looked at materials like photos, poems, paintings, um, social media, um, blogs and actually be able to quote those in your essays. So the, the counter argument is looking at giving examples and evidence of where diverse media represents place more accurately. So again, you'd be quoting some of those photos that you might have looked at, some of those paintings and how that represents place better than census data. And I would focus probably on it giving a better sense of place. However, does it fall short? How can it be manipulated? And maybe that actually it shows a curated view of the place that the person wants you to um, see. And throughout all of this, you should be using evaluative language. Um, don't just leave it to the conclusion. It needs to be right from the very, very start where you're showing, you know, this is more significant, this is less significant and so on. Right, I think we're on to um, Alice now. Thank you to uh, just have a look at past and present processes. Thank you, Suzanne. So we just got to the last bit of what AQA for that specification would like you to have a look at. And it's this idea that past and present processes of development can influence socioeconomic characteristics and be implicit in the place meaning. So implicit meaning assumed or always found in. So can we think of examples where past processes are being um, conveyed in one way or another, uh, perhaps by redeveloped places. And here, just just, just continuing what Suzanne was uh, talking about uh, around the area of East London, affected uh, and, and influenced, heavily influenced by investment linked to the Olympics, we've got Hackney Wick or Fish Island, which was traditionally an inner city industrial working class area, which had a thriving industry, uh, produced smoked fish, uh, mills that started as water mills became silk mills, chemical factories, making dyes and plastics and latterly conf confectionery. So sweet makers were all based in this area. And you can see the influence of past processes uh, in the built environment today. So this might be street names, might be uh, historic features. You can see a brick chimney, 
um, we can see uh, the photograph on the bottom right there is of a, a, a taller building called the Bagel Factory, uh, alluding to the Jewish population and, and, and Jewish heritage of the area. Uh, the Jewish population being incomers who perhaps lived in, in, a, in a greater level of deprivation than uh, those yuppies in their bright light warehouse apartments there today, because this area is being redeveloped. Can I have the next slide, please? So Grayson Perry in his Wreath Lectures talked about how areas that um, uh, suffer in deindustrialization and become cheaper places to live actually attract artists and attract attract uh, creative people who will move into an area because uh, house prices are cheaper and, and, and perhaps industrial warehouse space is available. And this definitely happened in Hackney Wick. So in the 1990s, the area was awarded financial support to become a creative enterprise zone and a home for many artists. But um, the process of gentrification that follows, um, that, that often follows um, the uh, moving in of, of artists and the and whole area becoming uh, cooler and more trendy has meant that property developers are, are uh, uh, moving in and, and raising prices. So if we have a look at the next slide, here we can see there's a bit of resistance to what's been going on uh, post Olympics in terms of the redevelopment of the area. Um, and uh, here we can see some 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 graffiti. Uh, it's out with the hippies and in with the yuppies. Uh, the middle photograph says uh, so, so. Perhaps the uh, the hoarding has has used the uh, term eclectic to help market the place. We can see the place making processes in. Uh, in full flow here, but then the graffiti says used to be, so used to be eclectic. So these are just photographs illustrating how the process of gentrification is being resisted by the existing groups, but perhaps existing groups like artists and local residents are being forced out of Hackney Wick as prices uh, go sky high. Okay, Suzanne, did you want to do the altered vowels, our last activity? Sorry, yeah, I was going to say no problem. Yeah, right. Okay, so alter vowels. This one is where um, one of the or the vowels have been changed to a different vowel. So you have to work out what you think the key term or phrase is. So if we could start with the first one there, or oh, what do you reckon? So remember, it's the all the vowels have been changed over to different vowels. So what do you think that one is? It's a word that we have been using through our um our session so if you know what you think it is if you can pop it in the chat box okay i haven't got c is going to be the first to guess that i is a different vowel at the beginning i think what you could what it could be sometimes these alice aren't they if you see it you see it and if you don't you don't so let's go and let's let's do the reveal john it is in fact those external agencies so people you know like tourist agents or it could be like the bbc that ended up being an external agent right um on to the next one <laughs> i quite like this word it's not a real geography word but i'd quite like if it is um so what do you think this one is i'm not even going to try and pronounce it i don't think <laughs> does anyone know Let's see if we can pop that on the chat box. And if you're at home, you might have instantly seen it. Remember, it's the vowels have been altered. Right, let's give it a reveal, John. It's topophobia. Okay, so that's that sort of dislike of a place. Right, next one, please, John. What do you reckon this is? Alice said it just a very short while ago. Remember, it's the vowels that have changed. See if you can work out what you think this one is. Oh, yeah. Well done, Maria. You did get both of them right. So I've just seen that pop up. I think my stream might be a bit slow. Oh, well done, Jack. You got there. Brilliant. Let's have the reveal, please. 
So it's gentrification. So that's what's going on in Fish Island and Hackney Wick. And um, you can see the artists are most upset with all their graffiti. It's an amazing place to go. If you get a chance to go, do go and have a look around before it changes too much. I've been going every year for about five years and I, I get lost every time because the streets have changed, new buildings have gone up. It's, it's fantastically diverse and dynamic. Right, last one, I think. Might not be the last one. <laughs> This one might be a bit easier. So see if you can pop it up in the chat box. Let's see, we're gonna get someone. Well done, Jack there first again. Right, let's have a reveal, John. So this of course, Tori's gaze, that's that manipulation. Um, and I think, have we got one more? No, we haven't, right, we're down to the, right at the end. So. Um, just giving signposting to you some additional support. So on Tutor to You, we've got two revision blasts. They were very exciting, great, just full of all games, both Changing Places 1 and Changing Places 2. And we've also got some links there to some multiple choice topic quizzes for A-level to really kind of get your head around all of the different concepts and um, the key words in this unit. And next week, I think uh, you can tune in again, same time same place um, looking at urban policy and regeneration in britain so that comes from the contemporary urban environments unit doesn't it alice yeah absolutely yeah, urban I'll be there. yeah. <laughs> wow thank you suzanne wow what a comprehensive se session absolutely what, what can i say uh, absolutely stunning stuff uh, really really interesting I've, I've loved every minute of that and i've learned quite a lot in, what, what's that top top of filia is the, the first word that i'd not heard of before so mm -hmm. um that that was uh, brilliant stuff and, and thanks so much to those of you who've been getting involved with some of the questions i, I tried to write uh, down as many names as i could as we were going through sam uh mariha uh josh jack thank you for your, for your suggestions and your answers there uh absolutely brilliant yeah. now i'm originally from uh coventry uh, which uh, gets quite negative publicity, I would say. Uh, in fact, you, if you get sent there, it's not meant to be the best, best of things. Uh, <laughs> but it is, of course, the current city of culture, uh, and oh, I'm really aware. And I'm, I'm really aware, of, you know, from family and friends who still live there, of of the effort that the city is putting into sort of like really changing the image of the place uh, because it's important to us, isn't it? It's important where we come yeah. from, and, and we want people to like the place don't we it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's an innate human thing I think that would you agree yeah totally yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, yeah. interestingly thinking about Coventry is, um, I, I, they've, they've got quite a few events they've been putting on a lot of art exhibitions and there's been quite a few TV programs based absolutely. around Coventry and I know they've actually got the uh, MOBOs so they've got big yes. MOBO music awards um, yeah. week after next I think I can't remember. Right. It so it's, it's a big deal for them. Big deal. We're really representing British culture. Dead right. Big match tonight against Birmingham as well. Come on, the sky. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, thanks again to everybody who took part, and thanks particularly to Suzanne yeah. and Alice for putting that together and, and delivering. Uh, a quick reminder that this slides, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, is available uh, to download immediately as soon as I've pressed uh, the finish button, and of course you can watch the entire video all over again. Brilliant stuff. So we're back on again next week, aren't we? Uh, and uh, oh, well, I think Alice, you're on. And uh, who have we got with us next week? We have Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman, and we'll see again. Suzanne again very soon, won't we, Suzanne? Yeah, yeah. I've sadly got a few parents' evenings to do, so <laughs> otherwise Work engaged. In a way. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Thanks, everybody, and we'll say goodbye there. Bye bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye then. <laughs>